Hi guys, it's Athene. Our trip is coming to an end. It was really an amazing experience traveling here. You have raised, in concert with Razor, $9.4 million for yes. Save the Children. That is a lot of money. It's really amazing to see how the gaming community is coming together, together with the industry. Gaming for good, it's called. You're literally helping save children in Malawi, also Indonesia, Bangladesh. Looking back and seeing where we came from, in the first video I uploaded about the best part in the world and seeing where we're now, what we managed to achieve together with you guys really puts a smile on my face. Gaming for good. What does it do and how did you come up with it? It's basically just a website where developers donate their games and when people donate to charity they get those games for free. <laughs> why we are doing this for Save the Children is because you guys are one of the most effective charities in the world. People always tend to thank me for what I'm doing. What I'm doing is merely being a voice and trying to raise awareness and it's the gaming community that is actually coming together and raising those funds. saying it's better to give rather than receive and you really felt that I saw you with the kids kind of gathering around you and you explaining gaming to them it's the best experience you can have we saved a child right there in front of my eyes we even had a US Marine that donated this entire paycheck when he saw the work we were doing he was so touched by it you guys are my inspiration for doing what I'm doing it's really what makes me happy I've already said I'm really proud to be a gamer because of everything you guys have been doing. I know at any point throughout the journey that this wouldn't be possible without you guys. I actually got to know Athene was through a very good friend of mine uh, who a lot of fans might know as Ian. I was at college slash university, it's like we call it Hogeschool here in Belgium, studying computer sciences with Ian and we always had a lot of conversations about uh, philosophy and, and values and life and activism. And He once told me that he had a really good friend. Uh, that I really had to meet if I like having those kinds of conversations. We were a family and there were uh, four kids. I think the childhood was pretty okay. Athene and I are just one year difference. Your brother, the first one, and then was uh, your sister Shefa, and then was you, and then Habiba. He was helping me when I am, I am seven years older than him and he, he know things more than me when he was a little boy and I was bigger. My first impression was to be like, um, he was kind of hot, and he was kind of funny. I didn't like his shoes. Je me suis marié ici dans les années 70. Je suis venu ici en Belgique le 19 octobre 1969. He came here over uh, at 1970 and uh, married with my mom. I actually was there at the right point to see it evolve. As a group which included Athene, his girlfriend Tanya, Ian and myself, we quickly became really active and our first project was Nay. Bashir was 25. That was the time Bashir and Jan started with a political organization called Nay. Nay became an actual thing here in Belgium that was talked about in the media, in the newspapers and stuff pretty quickly. It was not even political colored. It was just like you vote and then you have blank seat. Here in Belgium, you're mandatory to go vote. So people that don't want to go vote, they go vote and they just vote extremists. So we said like, you know what? We give people the ability to neutrally protest rather than freaking vote for fascists. One of the first things that they did was visiting all the houses of Antwerp 
the nine districts of Antwerp has a population of a half million people. So what they did was rang at every door they could, introduce themselves and saying who they are and what they stand for. Can you imagine what it means? It means that, you, that they worked 12 hours a day. They went for it. We didn't have any money to really have a real campaign. It was crazy and it was actually hard for me to see him like that because he would be gone very early and he would come out home late, very tired because they would walk like for eight or 10 hours a day and talking all the time, it was very hard on them. It was batshit insane, but it did give them the creds and the right to say, look, we visited everyone in Antwerp and it gave us a lot of media exposure. After that, they also uh, phoned every person of Antwerp again to say who they are. It's never been done in, in, in history, I guess. <laughs> May was the first project, the first activist project that we did together. Not the first thing that Athene did because he was also in politics before that and joined Big Brother with the intention of addressing certain social issues in Belgium regarding racism. One aspect that we had to deal with a lot uh, being uh, the family we grew up in is that there is a lot of racism. So when he was 16 he wanted to do, go to the politics because he said when I'm in the politics I have the power to change things. So when he was 18, he went in a politic party and he had a lot of votes. I was the youngest close elected person in Belgium ever. Not a lot of people know that. And since I was the first follower, that's what they call it, I had to be in all the meetings. When we were younger, Bashir and his brother, and Franco, another friend of him, did a lot of talking about things that were going wrong in the world. The discussions that I have with, I had with your brother, where you began to participate, influenced you a lot. He liked to confirm everything in science. In fact, he wanted to explain everything, logically. For me, one of the most crazy points is Big Brother. Bashir participated with Big Brother. When he said I go in Big Brother, we always said you are crazy. 30,000 or 60,000 people asked to come in the house, so I thought they're never gonna accept him to go in the house. I don't know how he did, but they accepted him. So he told when I am in the house, I can tell the people my thoughts. He was three days in Big Brother, and he turned them all around. Discrimination is the lelijkste to what there is in the world. So when he came out of Big Brother, he said they only let see to the people on the television what they want, not his ideas. And then he, he wrote a book. After his uh, experience in the Big Brother house, he uh, was invited in a talk show with Philip de Winter. And Philip de Winter is one of the most important person in the Xim Rights uh, Party in Belgium and there uh, Bashir was, was 18 years old and he stood uh, face to face to Philip de Winter talking about the things that happened in the Big Brother house and talking about the reasons why Bashir was voted out and the reasons why Bashir was invited in the house in the first place. Here in, in Belgium, in Antwerp, there are very much discrimination about Moroccan people. Every day you wake up like a kid, you have to fight this with with teachers and, and you are another person, you are not like them, you are different. It was very hard, it was very hard to grow up like this. Every year we went to Morocco and we lived there in a farm of the father of your father. No water, no electricity, no toilet. They learned also the other side of a good life. I think you liked the family because they were very warm and very hospitality. So they knew the two uh, sides of the life. I think it makes you what you are. Right after Ne came a series of failures that a lot of people are unaware of movie projects, film projects. We wanted to make a movie. Dean and I were the main brains behind the movie. And in order to work together as a team on these movies, we actually lived together. We moved into this place that was actually under construction. It was Franco's place. We were hardcore as a film crew, zero budget film crew, <laughs> trying to construct our own rigs and dollies and it was ridiculous. <laughs> we slept here, we worked here, our computers were there just like you saw them in the videos, like the computer where Theme was sitting, uh, normally next to it. I was sitting, and I had Ian, and I had Furious, and right after here, like here, there were mattresses, we were just sleeping on the floor, and this was our life. 
for like a year or so. This was it. So that didn't work. We then tried another incarnation of the movie, which was a completely different movie, but we gave it the same title. And uh, fragments of that also ended up on YouTube. And people really liked that one, but it didn't get so many views and didn't really go anywhere either. Most of the filmmaking stuff took place in the year after Ney. Now during that time, we still did a little bit of Ney campaigning because the year after the regional elections, there were national elections. We parodied other campaigns in Belgium and we took this to an extreme extent when certain political parties here were promising insane amounts of jobs. They were actually throwing with numbers like, you know, we're gonna give out so many jobs this year and then others will go like, no, 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 we, we're gonna double that up. People were sort of starting to laugh at that and saying this is impossible. So we wanted to give that dissatisfaction a voice and we thought what better way of parodying that than to say that our political party was promising also new jobs. 40,000 blowjobs for uh, everyone who would sign up. So getting mails about that, there's no blowjobs. So while we were doing all the filmmaking stuff and trying to get that lifted off, Athene had a certain idea about how we could make it lift off. I had a genius plan. World of Warcraft, most popular game. Nine million people play it. I just play the game, 5v5. We were actually plotting that out. Like, okay, so we need an audience. How do we get a global audience? How do we this and that? This was the intention from the get-go. And even though the Athene persona and the Athene series didn't exist yet, we were actually already doing these little update videos in which you sort of already had a version of the Athene persona. And Athene literally said, I'll just become the best paladin in the world. I'll just become the best World of Warcraft player. And that way, we'll have a massive audience because this is the biggest game. It's marketing, it's marketing, it's being brilliant. And this was on a different YouTube channel, so very few people actually saw these videos. And while it sounded crazy, Athene had been one of the top and most infamous players of Ultima Online. But the very first Athene video was actually sort of a joke, it wasn't a very calculated thing. Hi everyone, this is uh, Athene, best paladin of the server, uh, battle group, but also the world. At the time, Athene was number one in, I think, all PvP brackets, and as a prank, a friend of his who he would play together with was known as Jess or Navarium got a hold of his details, logged in on the WoW forums and made this incredibly cocky post. It was just hilarious. That thread became so huge. 15 pages, more than 10,000 views in like, in like that. It's because they know I, I'm good. We were like, we gotta make a video response to this and get back at Navarium. And that is why in the first videos, Furious is this very strange character who pretends to be Navarium. I'm gonna play with my uh, boyfriend here, Furious, playing Navarium. After that, everyone thought that the weird shirtless dude was Navarium. Slick. 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 Slick, yeah. Slick. It's slick. The Athene series, the Athene persona, that blew up pretty fast. That was our ticket. To having an audience which was the goal of the movie projects we wanted to have an audience to do stuff like what we are doing now we were activists to the core so we wanted to be global after the success of the first a theme video we kept on making a theme videos like once or twice a week and what's really funny is that we always had this very improvised way of shooting and making the videos never once did we script things or plan things ahead very much most of the videos we just started shooting and figured it out as we went along even when involving additional characters like Athene's mom like Athene's brother and for years most people didn't really know which parts of Athene were an act in which parts were real. Obviously, some of it was real because he really was a top World of Warcraft player. We always made sure to have a little bit of reality in the videos so that people were always not quite sure what to believe. It's my brother. <laughs> my colleague said, come on, are you the crazy guy of the Athene series? I said, yeah, it's me. He said, I can't believe it. We can't believe it. It's so real. It looks so real. That I'm so crazy. The, I guess, initial idea to become world famous as being one of the best World of Warcraft players and then using that stand to inspire people to become activists themselves is something that's almost unheard of. The first game that ever was bought was by my father. It was a, a machine, a small machine, very cheap, that you connect to the TV and you could play Pong. I think I learned you uh, chess, you remember that you were very small. He was 
very good at it. He was obsessed by it. And the first uh, console I bought, that was in 1989, I think, or 88, and it was Atari. Atari 2600. He also played board games with me. He also likes to play chess. I have to admit, I lost. <laughs> Uh, very very often. Then uh, in 1992 or 91 your sister bought a Sega Master System with uh, three games The Ninja, Ken Seiden and uh, Fantasy Zone. Then the computer game started. You had Cats, you had Dig Dug, you had Load Runner, Space Invaders also. The first game you played was Doom and then uh, Civilization and always finished as fast as possible. You had Command and Conquer, Red Alert, Command and Conquer Generals, always playing as fast as possible and finish it as fast as possible. His extreme rationality is no doubt what makes him so good at games. He's always been very eager to learn. And honestly, I think even compared to the teachers, he were developed far beyond their own level. When he was a little boy, I think he was seven years, eight years, nine years, the teacher is showing something in the class and he's telling, no, no, that's not true. And then he, he tell the teacher what he have to tell. And the teacher see that a boy from six years, eight years, nine years, 10 years, is knowing more than, than the teacher. It was definitely a theme's mental ability to break games and set all sorts of crazy records that fueled the virality of the videos the most, combined with the absolute absurdity of the characters and one very crucial component. Thumbnail gaming was a big thing on YouTube back then. A lot of people on YouTube would just get big because they managed to use very catchy or provocative thumbnails, and we were the kings of this mechanism. As with everything in our workflow, we were constantly evaluating what we could do with what we have. How could we reach a bigger audience? How could we do bigger things? Now, we were really early YouTubers. We were there at the beginning, so it was hard for us to partner or monetize our stuff. That was nowhere near as accessible as it is today. We were not making any money off of anything we were doing. And a few months after the very first Athene video, we started working on a full-length Athene movie. Not all fans know this, but there is an Athene feature film. There's an Athene movie. It's a full-length movie and it's really damn good. Every few years or so, I re-watch the movie and I'm like, this is a good movie. We spent just one month shooting this on the go, completely improvised, no script, and it actually turned into a good movie. It was amazing. This was uploaded about six to seven years ago, so the quality isn't that great, but Wrath of the Lead King is still viewable for free on our YouTube channel. Very shortly after we did Wrath of the Lead King, we also started doing the very first iPower videos. I guess I paid the most attention to a theme during the iPower I guess, error of his YouTube channel. I kind of noticed that it was taking a little bit more of a serious tone. iPower was a very interesting experiment because it is considered to be a self-development thing and it is, but the way we always saw it was self-development is something that should lead to activism. iPower was two things. It was a series on YouTube and it is a community website that still exists, both of which are focused on self-development and activism. We did some stuff with iPower that was net neutrality related very important. We were among the very, very first net neutrality activists on the internet. We were talking about the issue before any newspapers or media outlets were really reporting on it. Some people thought we were conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones for talking about net neutrality because no reputable huge media outlet was talking about it before we did. So we kept focusing on the Athene stuff, we kept focusing on trying to expand our audience and at the same time we had many years that we were still doing the iPower thing, but also discussing and trying to figure out how we were going to make a bigger and better difference. The reason that I'm not logging on a lot is because I'm playing at the moment poker. Since we weren't making any money off of anything we were doing yet, a good friend of Athene's, Jess, was actually doing really well playing online poker. And with Athene's mathematical insight and skills, he immediately said like, you know what, I'm gonna fix the money problem, don't worry. I got your back. He was just going to go no life mode, play poker non-stop every day for a year straight, even longer if needed, to scrape together enough of a budget that we didn't have to worry about anything anymore. The first time when he's playing poker style, I was thinking, oh my god, 
He's a gambler, and then he he won very very much money with this. As a poker player myself, to pretty much pick up the game from scratch almost just on a whim, and to become supernova elite in the first year, to break the world record of playing one million hands in a month is just completely remarkable. I don't think anybody to this day has ever achieved anything even close to that. Come on, give me some hands. Give me some hands so I can own it up here. I got a hand. I bet. I didn't hit it. I bluff. You wanna go to the river? Go to the river. You wanna call me down? Shipping the dough. That's how I roll. I'm 24 table and only it up. I made my own program. This is that table ninja crap. I made my own my own table ninja. You gonna bluff me out of the pub? Ooh! Ooh! Little bitch trying to bluff me out. Oh, are you trying to look look at what he's trying to do? Trying to bet against me? Shut up, bitch! King King against him. Like it. Oh! So even though Athene didn't have as much free time because the daily poker grind took up every single minute of his day, the whole poker thing sort of took the channel into a different direction where the Athene persona was sort of transitioning towards online poker and you would have these crazy achievements and records and wacky videos but in a poker context. So another thing that took place during the poker era was the Athene TV series here in Belgium. We actually had an Athene series here on TV in Belgium. It was in Dutch, well it was in a very Flemish Antwerp accent kind of style and the characters were also slightly different. It was some of the funniest stuff we had ever made and we had a blast making those videos. It was really really cool. In general, Athene was very focused on keeping up the poker grind, making sure that we had a future budget to work with and the rest of us were just sort of focusing on iPower stuff. And unfortunately as a result some of the bond kind of faded and we saw Ian and Dean leave the crew as it were. A lot of things happened because I was playing poker and because I had really very low contact. Ian, uh, Don, and in a lesser extent, Reese were actually experiencing a lot of pressure and stress because they knew that I was working my ass off to pay for their bills. And since we were all working in a very right action mindset, trying to make a difference, there was a certain level of expectations that they experienced that was not always as real because there was no feedback loop. Playing poker almost like some kind of machine, you have almost no contact pokering 14 to 16 hours a day. If you're on the other side and you're looking at the situation, you can easily create certain thoughts and certain ghosts about that person because of the absence of feedback. The reason why I'm explaining all this so much in depth is because it explains the drastic event that took place and really affected a lot of our lives very drastically. When I was playing poker, I got a message from, I think it was Reese saying they wanted to talk to me about something very serious. What happened that day is still a puzzle to me. Reese came, Don and uh, Ian. Reese was a bit disoriented, but basically what happened is they came over and they said that they didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. That I was not their friend anymore and that I can keep my money. They don't need it. The conversation wasn't that long. I was confused because I didn't know where it came from and I was also like but like I'm playing all this poker hands I'm getting supernova lead not because I want to get rich I'm doing this because I try to make sure you guys that we can work and, and make a difference in the world and they said to me like no you don't understand we don't want to have anything to do with you anymore and they left. I was first like trying to figure out if I did something wrong I must have done something or asked something or but I was just very isolated and working every day. I didn't almost had no contact with them. And I tried to get back in touch with them. Same day even, I also wrote a very big letter. Reese came over the next day because he was also really confused whether he wanted to do the things and stuff. He didn't really know. He told me that Ian said that if they would come and they wanted to do their own thing, I would just try and pressure them and become aggressive. And he warned them. They even changed the password from the YouTube channel, the theme wins. But Reese immediately saw that it wasn't true because I was not going aggressive. I was just trying to understand the situation and be rational about it. I just said to Reese, like, I got to talk to them. A lot of people would have heard this and go like, man, fuck them. But like, I really valued the friendship a lot. It was so weird that that happened. It was not thought through at all. It was very impulsive. It was a burden that I carried for a very long time because I don't know how much people can identify with how much I valued friends. Friends were more important than my girlfriend. Friends were more important than my family. Friends were just the people you choose to just, you know, make a difference, grow up, can trust each other, can back each other up no matter what. And then that happened. It was paradigm shifting for me. It was really shattering. 
I was wondering at that point even if I should keep going for Supernova Elite because I was like, why am I doing this if it's not for them? I mean, I'm not playing poker because I want to get rich. I don't care about money. But then I decided like still to go for Supernova Elite. I was like talking to Reese, like, yeah, worst comes to worst, we just donate all the money. That's a lot of money. We can make a big difference with that. And even though Reese was still trying to figure it out, he was the only one from the group that could look at the situation and say like, this is really wrong what just happened. And I don't want to be part of this. I I always try to reach out to both of them because I know that we would be able to achieve so much more. That was a pretty turbulent era and even though we didn't hear anything from Ian anymore in a very long time and Dean only appeared in a limited range of videos hereafter, Athena and I kept on going. Next up was the Poker Stars PCA tournament. Hello everyone, this is Gloria Balding for Poker News at day 1B of Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure. Why? Why are you so famous? Because of the guns! You have stacks of those t-shirts under your chair and you're giving them out to people. I'm giving them out because a lot of people ask. I'm afraid by going a little bit too over the top that I would just get disqualified. Going way too over the top. So this is the subtle version of you? Ha, I'm gonna play some poker, I'm gonna stack some noobs. That was all a really crazy experience and we have some amazing videos of Athene meeting Daniel Negrano and being the Athene persona at the PCA in Bahamas. It was amazing. The online poker community definitely remembers Athene. They probably remember him more as Chiron80, which was his nickname in online poker, but there's so many funny things that we did with that, just like Athene did so many funny things in World of Warcraft and became such an icon in there. He also caused quite a stir in online poker, both in terms of really funny stunts and videos and records, just like in other games. As we were sort of wrapping up the poker stuff, we were asking ourselves what our next project would be in terms of what could we do that would really make a difference or that would really inspire a large audience in a positive way. We always firmly believe that even from a scientific angle, you can look at evolution and you can look at anthropology and just prove that human beings want to help each other. It's, it's how we've evolved. And we thought like, what if we make an incredible scientific documentary that focuses on the inspiring aspects of science, it would get a lot of people thinking, it would make people aware. That was the idea behind Athene's theory of everything. The result of this was one of our most popular and most talked about videos that we released after almost a year of research and editing. It didn't do much. It didn't do much at the start. It inspired a lot of people. It, it had an effect especially on the iPower crowd and such. It didn't go much beyond our own audience and a lot of Athene fans were very confused. They were like, why is Athene doing a science documentary? Our audience was only used to trolling at that point. We had barely ever done serious videos outside of the realm of iPower, so it was very weird for them to see. We adapted immediately. We just went like, okay, we have to keep building relevance though. We can't lose our audience. We gotta go back and make Athene videos. Athene has to come back. You need, you need to drum the drums It was pretty good. We went all out making Athene videos for a while and we really built that back up. Other things of note that happened around this time were Athene's crazy record-setting StarCraft stunts and Kez coming over. This was the result of a video where Athene announced he would be picking someone from the comments to be trained by Athene to become a pro at games and at life. It was a very funny concept that made for some great videos, but Kez actually was a great addition to the team for the time that he managed to stay here. We actually started working much closer together with the help of Franco, whose house we had lived in way back in the beginning when we were making movies or trying to and we were making the first theme videos. He said like, look, if you ever need a place to work, you can actually use a downstairs room as a studio. We were very creative on a lot of fronts to get back into the game. And it was a tough climate because botting was becoming very popular on YouTube. People were botting their views. If you just got enough views fast enough, to get on the YouTube front page, your botted views would then quickly translate into tons and tons of real views because you're on the front page of YouTube.com. This was something that we had to fight against and we did. We were very vocal about it, we made videos about that and we did everything we could to not just gain a bigger following but also to make the YouTube landscape a better place. So aside from fighting the botting and doing all we could in terms of talking to people who work at YouTube, we were also trying to give as much exposure as we could to people on YouTube who were completely undiscovered and were not getting any views and we called this this idea to get her to the top. He's embarked on a very ambitious 
project he's helping us all you know together to the top right and the phrase together to the top was just something Athene said at the end of a video somewhere but it became a movement youtubers started using that phrase and say like yeah together to the top we gotta back each other up and people started to use that as sort of like the mantra of the YouTube community, at least among gamers, was an insane thing to see. He made a personal video for everyone who would send him a private message on YouTube asking for it. This was one of the most insane things we did in terms of internet stunts. Athene literally filmed thousands of personal videos. He would personally respond to what someone's channel would be like. With the Athene comeback, with Together to the Top, we were doing pretty well all of a sudden. We were in the top 100 YouTube channels and we were going up really quickly. At the same time, the Yolks cast was growing very quickly as well. And we did our very first Minecraft video together with them. And that was right before Swifty accidentally got banned from World of Warcraft because of a fan event he did that crashed their servers. And out of that came the legendary support video that we made for him. And we became great friends with Swifty and did a lot of videos together over the years. We also started going to cons and events, which is something that we had never done before. Our first one was Gamescom 2011, and it was a revelation to us. We knew we were big on YouTube, but we were nowhere near the biggest. Yet somehow, maybe because we attract a more mature audience, maybe because Athene has been around for so long as an icon in the gaming community, we get swarmed by more people than anyone else at conventions. It is the most insane thing. We saw it at Gamescom, we saw it at BlizzCon, and what really blew our minds is just how many fans we have in Sweden when we go to Dreamhack. And it was while all this was unfolding that we got in touch with former porn star Mia Rose who contacted us and really liked our videos and who we've since been really good friends with. We also continue to do science videos every now and then, often together with a good friend of ours who is a theoretical physicist, Frederik van der Wege. Towards the end of 2011, we sort of moved our studio again to a new place where we would all live under one roof. Athene, Tanya, my girlfriend Vanessa and myself. And with the beginning of 2011, 2012 came the epic announcement of our sponsorship with Razer. We worked out a very unique setup with Razer. They would sponsor us purely in gear that we would be able to give out to the community as we saw fit. From this point on, we had half a million dollars of Razer gear to our disposal. And we always made sure to use it in ways that stimulates the community, whether it's related to Together to the Top or charity events. 2012 was in some ways even more eventful than 2011. As defenders of net neutrality, of course we were also part of the SOPA slash PIPA blackout and we did our best to be as effective as we could by live streaming and having our entire community actually contact senators to try to make them see the importance of not letting this bill pass. During that event we actually got tweets back from senators who told us that we made them change their mind. We also became a bit less active in terms of spotlight other channels in the together to the top fashion because instead we were fighting a lot more behind the scenes talking to networks like machinima and eventually also curse to see what could be done for youtubers who are having a hard time getting into the scene or simply avoiding getting ripped off by their networks we eventually voluntarily consulted for curse to help them write a truly fair contract for youtubers who want to join their network and it was our decision to call the network union for gamers even though we were quite happy with machinima at the time we always saw more competition and more more options for YouTubers as a very good thing. Later that year, Machinima became more and more controversial as a lot of its partners started speaking up about how they felt ignored or just flat out tricked into signing certain contracts without knowing what they were getting themselves into. At that point, we ourselves joined Union for Gamers as well. What mainly set Union for Gamers apart from other networks was the fact that while you were getting a very high CPM, you could also leave the network whenever you like, while other networks would lock you in with contracts for two years all the way up to seven years. But of course, the real milestone of 2012 was Sharecraft. It was only after a small World of Warcraft event that we organized to raise money for Save the Children that we started to realize just how much we could achieve with online fundraising. And around this time you had the incredibly viral Kony 2012 phenomenon, which quickly suffered an incredible backlash. We decided to do something crazily ambitious and we took the opportunity to respond. I was really inspired when I saw the Kony 2012 video to see how many people actually took the time to share it. But not long afterwards, the backlash started and the people that were supporting it were starting to get criticized for not doing their homework and not researching the actual charity behind it. What I've learned from the Kony 2012 video 
it's not whether or not we did our research right or wrong, but rather that an inspiring idea to bring change and help other people out can go more viral than anything else. Regardless of the debate surrounding invisible children, the phenomenon of the film's virality shows that the common perception of being powerless against all that is injustice in the world and the idea that people tend to be indifferent is obviously inaccurate. The internet has come to such a point that the only thing we need to overcome this widespread belief is to collectively reach out for what we believe is right and often real change will follow. The whole way in which charities operate is changing because it's not anymore just about sharing wealth but also knowledge, information, opinions and feelings. So I'm trying out a little experiment. I'm launching Operation Sharecraft. It's a project focused on charities that have been thoroughly researched and proven to be efficient and effective. I decided to start by focusing on Save the Children's work in the Horn of Africa. It has not been covered so much by mainstream media and uh, this is where millions of people right now are struggling to survive the worst hunger crisis in 60 years. Whether or not this experiment is going to work will only depend on whether people believe that their actions will matter or not. That is how small the difference is between raising one million dollars or raising nothing. And I know I'm setting the bar high, but the goal of this experiment is to set an example and show that we have come to a time where our drive to share things is the only thing required to bring real change. It was a goal so ambitious that we doubted many, many times and we lost faith many times in whether we'd be able to do it. Every day we tried to raise $10,000 and we had so many huge contributors as well as thousands of donators who made sure to contribute whatever they could. A lot of people will remember Moral, a friend of ours who came over from Sweden and poured so much of her heart and soul into helping out and live streaming with us to try to get the 1 million. One sort of iconic moment that summarizes how emotional and tough it was was to really stick to it and try to hit that 1 million goal over the course of 100 days about tomorrow what we're gonna do and then we saw like like people were saying like oh someone donated 1250 I was like what the fuck that's not true that cannot be true you donated so much while there is no show going like what inspired you what's the story behind this I've been watching you uh, for a couple of years now I think so you've always been a big inspiration to me you know you've been a, an idol in the gaming community for a long time and this uh, operation sharecraft is like your big thing, so I just wanted to show my support for you in the gaming community. All right. Well, because you, uh, you know, you took the time out of your day to, you know, thank me for, you know, just doing what I do. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and donate another two hundred dollars. No man. <laughs> That's fucking badass, man. Like, like it goes to them kids, man. Like. I really want to thank you, man. That's fucking... You're a fucking boss, man. That's just crazy. Is crying? <laughs> you won't lose me. I'm going to be a loyal, I'm a loyal fan. Merle is crying here next to me. <laughs> you made her cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Merle. I didn't mean to make you it's cry. No problem, man. <laughs> like, this is very intense. Uh, so, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Moral, she's very touched here. You did give it another 200 and someone else gave another 100. Are you serious? Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, Moral, come, you have to say thank you. You have to say thank you to them. Moral, say thank you to them. <laughs> Meryl, you want to say something to the viewers? Thank you.
Athene's ShareCraft project is the most ambitious charity event in the history of esports. With the live streaming and with how things have been evolving, basically almost all donations have been coming from you guys. This entire event has been carried by the shoulders of our community. I've just been thinking like what can we do in order to spread awareness around this matter? What can I do? I've done research and it's gonna be done in a very responsible way. I'm gonna go on hunger strike. Athene, if you end up watching this, just just be careful, man. I'm a lot weaker. You're uh, easily affected by emotions and stuff. This is my fifth day today. We actually got international media with my hunger strike, with all the people also joining, uh, contacting press. I want to do a big shout out to everyone that's been helping out. It really makes me smile to see everybody coming together. Athene stepped up to really create a massive project like this. He's already more than $300,000 there. This is what you guys have raised the past 80 days. Almost $1 million for the Horn of Africa for Save the Children, for children facing the worst hunger crisis in 60 years. I wanted to hit that $1 million live on stage. Do you guys think we're gonna hit it right now? Yeah! If we hit the $1 million, I want you guys to go crazy. We hit it! it. We, we, we hit it? We've hit one million dollars! We've hit one million dollars! We've hit one million dollars! It was the biggest thing we had ever done and we had done a lot of things. And even during ShareCraft, there were so many things that happened. For example, this was when Riot Games updated League of Legends with Athene's Unholy Grail, an in-game item named after Athene because of the amount of referrals that he brought to the game. We were absolutely exhausted from ShareCraft, but we learned a lot. For the first time, we had truly found a way to inspire a massive audience and make things happen that are truly significant and important on a global scale. It's the stuff that we had always wanted to do, but we just didn't know exactly how. And with these newfound insights, we focused more and more on charity initiatives and finding ways to inspire. Later that year, we also made a bite-sized sequel to Athene's Theory of Everything, and what really ended up inspiring a lot of people and made it so that in the future we'd be able to really show our audience what kind of a difference they make, is that in the second half of 2012, we were able to visit Save the Children's programs in Mali. We went to a remote village in Mali that doesn't have any access to internet or electricity. Like we want to play some football, but he said that his ball is broken. <laughs> you see a lot of kids here that uh, have never seen a computer, never accessed a computer, and I thought it would be a cool idea to give them the possibility to do a Reddit AMA. This takes like the satellite connection through this. All right, we got it live, guys. One of the questions was whether she was happy or not. What makes, me, what makes her happy? And she answered that she actually didn't know. She also said that she thinks a doll would make her very happy. I'm not working for Save the Children, I'm actually independent. I'm just here by myself with my camera guy for my YouTube channel. We're driving around right, right now trying to find a shop. Okay. How many can we take? Um, the reason why I'm here is because we raised $1 million with Operation Sharecraft and Save the Children has actually allowed us to come. We made the Reddit AMA, a lot of people were really touched by it and we thought like, yeah, it would be a really good idea to come back. This is the only doll in the entire market and uh, yeah, it's gonna make a girl very, very happy. We bought a lot of balls. All the children will be here to be able to play and we also have like a doll and the children has a lot of food programs and medical programs for this area. Last time when I came here, they brought me a ball. You can see it's completely broken. Uh, Jay is her name and she's around 10 to 11 years old. She doesn't know exactly. Can you tell her that 
like a lot of people saw her and were really touched by her and thought that they had to make her wish come true. Two thousand twelve was a crazy year, and what topped it off at the ending was a ridiculous experiment that we undertook with our YouTube channel. With changes to the YouTube algorithms, it looked more and more like a YouTube system would favor the channels that put out more content a day. We thought we would put this to the test. We did something that no other YouTuber has done before. We went through a phase where we did 24 to 48 videos per day. We had a super optimized workflow for this. People were flooding us with questions. How are you doing this? You're making 24 to 48 videos a day and, and they're not bad. These are like, these are good videos. <laughs> It ended up not really helping us much, but it was an interesting experiment. Moving into 2013, as we focused more and more on live streaming, we also saw a lot of turbulence in that landscape. The site we used to stream on for Sharecraft was not doing well financially, and it was getting shut down, leaving no other competitors in the landscape aside from Twitch. Luckily, Twitch was actually a pretty great partner for our charity efforts. They worked with us to set up a subscription system in such a way that whoever would subscribe to our Twitch channel would actually be donating to charity. So which actually never pays us one cent. All subscription revenue goes to save the children. Now, we didn't really have another Sharecraft planned for 2013. We assumed we would not be able to top Sharecraft in any shape or form, but we kept on streaming for charity and seeing where that would take us. The Twitch subscription system was a great help and a very cool way of raising donations. On the side, we also were building up a website called Gaming for Good because we were working with game developers such as Red5, who had at times given us thousands of keys for their games. And over the course of the year, we have featured more than a hundred games on Gaming for Good, all of them hand-picked because we always wanted to feature the games that our audience would really like. But just as with Sharecraft, the main thing that people donated for was the live stream. We expanded on the live stream concept quite a bit. We added a webcam that was pointed towards the street. And if anyone felt compelled to donate a very large amount just to see us running our underwear in the freezing cold on the street, this was a service that we could provide. There have been so many crazy moments like that that we've done. I mean, there's been a moment where Athene shaved his head bald. It was not our intention to make him go bald. We were just saying like, look, we'll cut a tiny piece of his hair for every person who donates. It was like the internet suddenly conspired and it went viral. And people said like, we are not leaving until he is bald. And we were like, no way that you guys can do this. We're just cutting very tiny pieces of hair for every donation that comes in. And it was a $5 donation because it was a subscription. We didn't sleep that night. We kept cutting hair. We raised $160,000. Another new component we added to the live stream was the night shifts. Basically, we started streaming all day, every day, and people would donate. But when we would go to bed, donations would stop. So we thought, why not have a night shift and have people from the community take over the moment we go to sleep. Gaming for Good sort of became the name of the whole operation. And the biggest Gaming for Good event of 2013 was the Siege. The Siege was an event of incredible scale. An absolutely massive range of well-known Twitch streamers and YouTubers joined in for a whole weekend to see how much money we could raise if we all teamed up together. Blizzard was launching their Siege of Ogrimmar patch and they had asked us to see if we could do anything special to promote it. Little did they know that we were about to launch the biggest community event that World of Warcraft had ever seen. The goal was to raise half a million dollars during the weekend and we quadrupled that. SibHD alone raised one million dollars with the matching included. We did not expect to hit a total goal of 10 million raised in 2013. It was only as we got closer to December that we started realizing that we might actually make it to 10 million dollars raised. As a result, the story of Gaming for Good was becoming so big that it even got picked up by outlets like CNN's Headline News, Fox, The Wall Street Journal, and Bloomberg TV. Two years ago, $1 million seemed nearly impossible. But moving forward in 2014, having achieved things that have affected more than a million lives, we've come to learn that when gamers unite on a global scale, nothing is impossible. <laughs>